you glad that's true? I'm glad that's true. He can keep us singing all along life's way. And boy, there's nothing like having a song in your heart. A song in your heart can help you when the world falls apart. I'm telling you, you can have a song in the night. I think that's one of the first songs my mom and daddy taught me when I was just a little bitty lad and they put me up on the... You, yeah, your daddy done you that way too, didn't he? Put you on a chair and set you up where everybody could see and, and you had to sing. And, and boy, that's where I learned to sing. And uh, I had to sing, you can have a song when the sun's shining bright, but you get to have a song in the night. Boy, I'm glad I got a song in the night. Boy, I'm telling you, I'm glad we'd have a song. He can keep us singing. Oh, aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord? There's nothing like having a place in the house of the Lord and coming into the house of the Lord and worshiping him. So good to see all of you here. I'm so thankful for the Lord's blessing on our lives and to meet together in his house. There's nothing like it. Amen. Excited about being here today and thanking God for all of his blessings. Amen. Remind you, of course, tonight, our evening worship service at 6, Kids Blast at 6. We're going to have a wonderful time around here today. We're getting geared up for VBS just a, oh, just a week away. Boy, I'm telling you, we're going to kick it off and have a good time. Things are going to change around here this week. we got got VBS planning and, uh, well, not planning, decorating going on. Starting this week, or it's already started, but it'll be happening more and more out here this week. And we're getting excited about our kids coming in and learning about Jesus. You know, I texted out this week, kids need Jesus. Boy, I'm telling you, if there's ever been a day that kids need Jesus, it's today. It's today they need to hear about Jesus. I'll say some more about that in a little bit. I'm not going to preach two sermons this morning. And the people said... I saw that. I saw some amens right quick. Amen. Please, please, preacher. Hey, Amen. Well, I, I understand that. You can't comprehend everything in one sermon. I can't even comprehend everything in two or three sermons in once, you know. But anyway, let's pray. And uh, we ask the Lord to help us today. He knows what we stand in need of. Good to see some of y'all back. Some of you's been out and been uh, different places. Amen. Sister Glenda's here this morning. Sister Glenda Norton. Boy, she's been through the fire the last few weeks. And God's held her. Hallelujah. Mm. I want to squall with her. I have been squalling with her, but boy, I'm glad she's here this morning. We want to pray and ask the Lord to help her. And uh, Brother Reggie's here. His wife's recovering from surgery, and thank God, doing well. We praise the Lord for that. And others, I start calling names. I leave somebody out and said, Preacher didn't even call my name. Y'all remember that old song? I remember that old song. But anyway, I'm glad God knows you. He knows exactly where you're at, exactly what you're going through, and he knows how to help you. He can help you more than I'd help you. Aren't you glad of that? Boy, I am so glad he can. Boy, we serve an awesome God. And boy, he knows. I was talking to him this morning a little after five. And boy, I'm telling you, just uh, I told him, I said, Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to be humbled. Whatever you need me to do, whatever you want me to do, I'm not above it, boy. And I'm thankful he knows. He really does. He knows how to help us. So let's pray, ask him to help us today, and ask him to meet our needs today. Amen. Lord, you are a gracious God. And I'm thankful and grateful for who you are and what you're doing and what you know you want to do in this place today. So I ask you, Lord, you speak to our hearts, even this moment, each one of us here today. Uh, Lord, we have different needs, different situations in our lives, and you know about each one of them individually and collectively as a church. We have needs, but individually we have needs as well. And I'm glad you're able to meet those needs uh, independently and individually and collectively. You're an awesome God. <laughs> oh, I'm thankful you are. Nothing too hard for you. Lord, you've reminded us of that in your word, and then you've proved in that so many times over and over and over again in our lives. And Lord, we can look back on the history of our lives and the prayers that you've answered and the many, many mighty works that you've done. And Lord, I just want to proclaim it today. And we want to praise you once again for who you are and what you're doing. Help us now as we worship you. Speak to our hearts in a real way. And we'll be careful to thank you and praise you for all you are and all you do. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen, amen. Let's worship him today, all right? Sister Jennifer's coming. Let's sing together and worship him.
they pass me by I can see it in their eyes Empty people filled with care Headed who knows where On they go through private pain Living fear to fear Laughter hides the silent cries Only Jesus hears People need the Lord People need the Lord At the end of broken dreams He's the open door People need the Lord People need the Lord When will we realize People need the Lord We are called to take His light to a world where wrong seems right what could be too great a cost for sharing life with one who's lost through his love our hearts can feel all the grief they bear they must hear the words of life only we can share people need the lord people need the lord at the end of broken dreams he's the open door people need the lord people So true, Sister Jennifer. Thank you so much. Such a beautiful song and so true to our ears. We need to realize people need the Lord. Amen. Daniel, the book of Daniel. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Daniel. I want to read some verses there. The book of Daniel, chapter number one. Book of Daniel, chapter number one. It's been a busy morning uh, this morning. We've been gearing up for VBS and had a lot of things to get into place, of course, at these last minutes. And uh, uh, I've had printer problems this morning, so uh, didn't get it. Uh, I preach from notes and making a lot of notes. I started many years ago uh, in my schedule of preaching, and uh, I guess uh, learning uh, to preach from notes years ago, learning from an outline, it stops me most of the time. I did say most, not all, from rambling. Stick to my notes. Somebody say amen right there. Uh, preacher don't have notes, of course. He's, he's prone to run rabbits forever. And those rabbits will run and run and run. So I try to, try to stay close to my notes, and uh, that'll help me. And that'll help you. Amen. Because that helps me, that helps you, and that helps us all stay on track. And uh, hopefully we won't uh, be here all day. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Wonderful. I was hoping that somebody would say amen right there. If you're able can stand with me, I will read these verses. Daniel chapter number 1. It's around 600 years before the birth of Christ. Egypt and Babylon uh, would be the two superpowers on the planet. And, of course, in 605 B.C., uh, Babylon is going to move in 
uh, with a superpower and overtake Egypt, gaining control. Nebuchadnezzar, of course, uh, his dad's going to die and he's going to seize control and he's going to move into Jerusalem and take over and seize the city. And he's going to carry away the sacred vessels out of uh, the, the city there as God's going to allow it. And he's going to carry them back to his God. We're going to see that here in verse number 2. And he's going to, of course, uh, try to humiliate Jehovah and infuriate God of the Hebrews. And, of course, he's going to try to uh, overcome the world. And uh, all these things, of course, are part of the prophecy that Jeremiah told, of course, of uh, the Lord. I told him as God's people got away from the teaching of God and teaching, uh, putting God and keeping God first. It's a very uh, reminiscent fact of what uh, similar things have happening in America today. I'll say some more about that in a few moments, but Nebuchadnezzar, of course, adopted the policy of using the most promising young people in his new empire, of course, trying to raise them up and uh, use them. He captured, uh, they believed to be over 60 out of Jerusalem and Judea and brought them back and began to try to uh, program them to the things of Babylon. I'll say some more in the scriptures and, of course, in the message this morning because so important as the parallel of what's happening in our nation with many of God's people. Look at it with me. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judea, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judea, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. His God, of course, uh, being uh, Marduk, and he puts the vessels, verse 2, he brought them into the uh, vessels into the treasure of the house of his God. And the king spake unto Aspenaz, the master of his eunuchs, and he should bring certain of the children of Israel and the king's seed of the prince of, uh, of the princes. Now look at verse 4. And the Bible says here, in verse 4, he gives a description of what these children are. Children, he calls them, of course, these are young men, believed to be between 13 and 17 of age, and whom is no blemish. He gives a description of these young men, and he gives at least seven characteristics of them. Look at this with me. In whom there's no blemish, that's without defect, of course, uh, physically. Nebuchadnezzar wanted the flawless specimens in his court being well favored that means they're good looking to the eye and of course he wanted to put them on display uh, the physical qualities Nebuchadnezzar cared about his image sort of like we do here in America and skilled in all wisdom you notice he's also wanting uh, wise people wisdom he didn't want to be look good looking and not be able to spell and not me out right there Anyway, keep moving here with me. And he said, and cunning in knowledge. They had to be endowed with understanding. Literally, they had to be able to know knowledge and knowers of knowledge. That's what it literally means. They had to be able to understand, discern wisdom. Understanding science, the Bible says. Th these men had to be able to discern and be able to gather data and to understand and decipher data, correlate facts, all those kind of things. And such as had ability in them to stay, uh, stand in the king's palace, we're told here in verse number four. And finally, whom they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans. Now notice that with me. The Bible says they had to be boys, young men that could learn new manners and customs. As something to teach uh, teenagers manners. We have to start early, of course, teaching manners. No, no doubt these young men knew manners. They knew, uh, you know, proper etiquette. But they're going to learn new manners and customs. You understand that now? They're going to Babylon. And they're going to learn the manners and the customs of Babylon. Understand that with me. We read the Bible a lot of times and we don't really understand it. They're going to stand in the king's palace and understand the Babylon way. In other words, you're going to have to do away with all this God stuff that you knew. We're going to teach you the world's 
ways. Still with me? Okay. They've been in, introduced to the Babylon gods, the mythology of creation, the flood has gone away, the original mankind that you've learned, the pleurisy of gods you're going to be introduced to. These men are going to be taught and they're going to be trained about the kings and the diversity, if I can say it, of our new society. And you're going to be educated in new agriculture and the history and the laws and all these other things. Uh, not monotheism, but uh, pluralism now. You're going to have to be taught. The Hebrews believed in the one true God, but the polytheism. There's more than one God. You know that. Surely you're not an idiot, Hebrew boys. Surely you know there's more than one God. They're going to teach them. Now stay with me. Verse 5. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among them of the children of Judea, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom, verse 7, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Let's pray. Father, help us now as we look into your word that we might see what you want us to see in these days in which we're living, that we might be equipped to stand and be your people in these days. Lights in dark worlds, in dark places, that we may be able to uh, be your children, be your people, and make a difference in these days to point people to Jesus. And we ask this in your holy name, Lord Jesus, and for your sake, and for the gospel's presentation today. Amen. You may be seated. The book of Daniel, of course, is an amazing book. When you look at it and study it, you'll find the adventures of Daniel and his friends in the first six chapters. And then in the latter six chapters, you'll find, of course, Daniel and the future. Uh, God gave to Daniel some amazing things. He, of course, entrusted to Daniel some amazing things. In this book, this little book, 12 chapters, God gave Daniel some secrets, if I can call it that. He revealed to him some things. The book speaks of Daniel's amazing life. He takes him into captivity from Judah to Babylon, into a foreign world, away from all the godly things that he was surrounded by, his godly parents, his godly home, his godly environment, and yet it had gone downhill. The godly things that he was surrounded by had actually become so ungodly it was amazing uh, I think it was Warren Wiersbe who said, uh, uh, he, he said in his commentary, he said, uh, God evidently would rather have his people living in captivity in a pagan land than living like pagans in a holy land. I thought that was so amazing. Of course, it's so true. Uh, that is true because uh, they were in the holy land, we know it as, there in Jerusalem, but yet they had become so unholy that God allowed him to go into captivity. Uh, so much like uh, the land in which you and I live. It's looking so ungodly, isn't it? It's hard to say America is still a Christian nation when we look and see what we are embracing as a nation and putting the seal of approval on as law in our land. It's absolutely appalling. And yet you see this uh, they're taken away into Babylon. And in this book, you see him choose one of these uh, four. And, of course, of these four, uh, they are to serve Nebuchadnezzar, this, uh, this pagan king, this ungodly king. And yet God uses these men and uses uh, Daniel to show him uh, God's secrets. It's amazing what God shows him and how God uses him in this pagan environment, this ungodly world, this ungodly capital of all places, God's going to use him to shine for him. 
Oh, wouldn't you like to be that kind of person that shines in a dark world? Wouldn't you like to be that kind of person that God entrusts his secrets to? That God would talk to you in such a manner that you would know what the answer is to the question. You would know how to respond in the situations of life. You would be in, enlightened to what God is doing and enlightened to how God would want you to live and respond to the situations of life as they come in these days in which you and I are living. Well, Daniel was that kind of fellow. Daniel was learning God's secrets. Daniel was learning God's secrets. And Daniel knew God's secrets. It's amazing how God was showing him the secrets that he had for this uh, pagan world that he was involved in, this pagan society around him. You know, it's an interesting verse, Psalms 25, verse number 14. Look at this verse with me. The Bible says, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Now, what an interesting verse. In other words, you're walking with God, you trust in him, you're fearing him, God lets you in on what's going on. He, he, is, uh, he is showing you his covenant. He's showing you. He uh, tells you what's going on. He reveals to you what's transpiring, how it's going to come to pass. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. He's going to show them what's going to happen. He's going to show them the promises. He's going to show them his commitment to them, how he's going to transpire things. It's amazing that uh, that verse and the covenant that he has with his people. I'm glad I'm one of his people, aren't you? Boy, everybody that knows the Lord should have said amen right there. Boy, I'm telling you, in these days you and I are living, I'm glad I'm one of his. I I'm glad I'm one of the, the Lord's. I'm glad I claim him and he claims me. More important than me knowing him, I'm glad he knows me. Aren't you glad he knows me? They may become a day in my life. Watch this very carefully now. Listen, to, listen now. You don't want to miss this. They may come a time in my life. I, I don't know. I don't know what's ahead in my life. I, I don't know, Brother Gene. I, I don't know how far I'm going to make it. I may not make it as far as you are, 90 plus years. But if I do, I hope I've got the mind you got. Boy, he's sharp. Boy, old Brother Gene back there, 90 plus years, and sharp as a tack. I, I thank God for people like that. Boy, I meet a lot of them. Sharp, boy, I'm telling you, sharp. You know, Brother Dale ain't near 90 years old, but he's still sharp too. But I hope, I hope and pray when I get on down life's way now, I still hope I'm sharp. But hey, they may come a time in my life, and uh, if I don't make it to 90, uh, they may come a time, Brother Eddie, that I may not make it to quite that many years that I don't even know where I am. And don't even know who God is. But I'm glad he still knows me. Woo! <laughs> Look out now. Don't all y'all shout at one time. Because that's more important than anything. I'm glad he knows me. Because the Bible records over there in the book of Matthew there's going to come a judgment one of these days where he's going to say to those, depart from me, I never knew you. I'm glad he knows me. Woo! I'm glad he knows me. And I'm glad I know him. I'm glad he hears, hey, hey. He, he, he knows me. I hear his voice and I follow him because he knows me and I know him. We got that kind of relationship. Let me move on right here. The Bible talks about here Daniel hearing his, uh, Daniel knowing his secrets. How does he know his secrets? Because he had a clean heart. Now the Bible talks about here in verse number 8. Daniel is taken off to a foreign land. He's taken off to, from everything godly around him into a pagan atmosphere. But the Bible said here in verse number 8 that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, I want you to notice here that Daniel purposed in his heart. Now, I've used this passage of scripture. If you've got an old Bible there you're looking at and you've, you, you've set my congregation many times, you may have me recorded that I've preached from this chapter many times. I try to preach from it at least once a year, especially to our young people, because it's so important that you understand this passage of Scripture and you understand it young in your life. Now, I've preached this passage of Scripture, and I've preached it different ways and different times. One of the, one of the uh, points I've made from this passage of Scripture is what, this very point. I'm not going to use it this morning. I'm using Daniel's clean heart. 
is how he knew Daniel's secret, how he knew God's secrets. He had a clean heart. He kept a clean heart with God. God revealed his secrets to people that have a clean heart. If you don't have a clean heart, God can't talk to you. You've got sin in your life. But you can clean up that heart and God will talk to you. But if you ain't got a clean heart, God's not going to talk to you. He's not going to talk to somebody who don't have a clean heart. Oh, David prayed, create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. And thank God, God did forgive old David. And he did clean up his heart. But I'm glad you can have a clean heart and God reveals his secrets to those who trust him, those who fear him, those who have a clear heart with him and a clean heart with him. Aren't you glad of that? I'm glad I can walk with God and he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own. Oh, I'm telling you the joy we share. David desired that clean heart. God gave him that clean heart. But I, I make this point. Let me go ahead and make this point. I used it in another sermon. Let, let me tell you this. This is how Daniel had a clean heart. He believed God's way was the best way. You know, we're living in a society that don't believe that no more. I was reading an article just this week. Reading an article about a young couple. <laughs> And this is what the article said. They had changed schools. They decided to, to uh, do, do something different with their children. And they were talking about putting their children in different schools, changing schools, whatever. They once had their children in a Christian school, and they decided to do something else. And, of course, they made it real public. You know, the uh, secular media is real quick to get on those kind of things and make it real public, you know, make it real public. But what they were saying was, of course, they were against the Christian school. And they said that they no longer believed all the Christian values that they once believed. You know what I said? Yeah, you, you quit believing this book. It's what happened. It's exactly right. They quit believing. Can I say it this way? They quit believing God's way is the best way. Now let me ask you that question. We'll move on. Do you still believe God's way is the best way? Now you're going to have to ask yourself that. And you're going to have to answer that question, not just this minute, not just today, but probably every month this year. Yeah. And probably some weeks every week this year. And as this thing continues to fire up and get a little heated, you may have to ask yourself every day, do I still believe God's way is the way? Because that's what Daniel believed. When he got carried off to a foreign field, when he got put to the test, he still believed, Brother Mick, that God's way is the best way. Now I'm going to stick to God's way. I'm just going to stick to God's way. I'm just going to believe God. He purposed in his heart. That's literally what that means. He purposed in his heart. He'd already decided his decision. Now watch this. If you believe that, if you truly believe that, here's what will happen. It will affect your choices. Now, people say that. I believe God's way is the best way. But you can tell they don't because it affects their choices. Still with me? Y'all ain't went to sleep on me, have you? Okay, watch this. I'll prove it. Daniel's decision affected his choices. Look, look right there at verse number 8. He would refuse the king's wine and his meat. Now, that was the Jewish custom, of course, but he's in a pagan world, and they're watching him. They want him to adapt to the Babylonian teaching and the way of life. We live in a world filled with all kinds of evil things, okay? Evil teachings that are against this book. I don't have to get into them, do I? Do I? Hello? Y'all with me? I don't have to get into them. You, you can read them. The world teaches all kinds of different things now. It's okay to do this. It's okay to do that. It's okay to do this. It's okay to do that. You know what the uh, Bible says. If you don't read the Bible, it'll tell you. The Holy Spirit will convict you if you're one of his children. And the world will say this. And the world will say that. And Daniel made a choice. He said, I'm going to stick with God. I'm going to stick with God's word. I'm going to believe what God says. And I'm going to live by what God says. That's what Daniel said. He purposed in his heart. And if, if you want to know, you have to ask yourself this. Ask yourself this, this question. What choices in my life, what choices in my life am I making right now not to defile myself with the world around me? Think about it. 
How am I living different than the world around me? There's some things you can, you can answer pretty quick. Well, I, I, don't, uh, I don't eat all the things the world eats. That's pretty quick right there in Scripture, Daniel, the meat. I don't drink all the things the world drinks. Okay? Here, here's some things down where the rubber hits the road, though. Here it is. I mean, look where I'm at right here on Sunday morning, preacher. The world's not here. Hallelujah. Thank God you're not. Like, now you're not living like the world. You are in the God's house on Sunday morning. I applaud you for that. That is a big difference. You're going to church. And thank God I applaud you for that because that's, that's, that is important. That is a real bold step to a lot of people that sometimes name the name of Christ and say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Me and the man upstairs, we got it worked out. And they don't never go to church. Oh, no. That's, you know that. I know that. I'm not judging them. I'm just saying how can you not defile yourself and you don't ever go to his house? You see what I'm saying? Thank God you are here. Do you live like the world? Ask yourself. I, I'm not judging you. I'm just asking yourself. Do you eat, drink, walk, go to the places the world goes? Careful now. Uh-oh. Does your life have any godly things? Godly things, amusements. Now, I know we all go to worldly things. You, you know, we, we all do those things, you know. I'm not against those things. I used to carry my boys to Braves games. I used to carry folks from church. We'd load up in the van and go on whatever it was, Tuesday night, whatever. We'd, I had the cheap tickets, and I used to get them on the upper. I was talking about it this week. I was talking to a guy Friday night about this. we load up that van, man. we get the upper level right on the front row of the upper level, down on the, man, he's hanging over. The old brave state. We hang over, boy. I carry them down there. Some of the kids ain't never been to ball game. I'd get them, boy. We load them up in the van. I carry them down there. It's amazing. We have a grand old time. I'm telling you. And then, then, then the, I got connections to get down on the down on the field level, brother, brother Michael. Get down on the floor. And, and one year, I got some good tickets, and we <laughs> rotated from the upper level to half, halfway through the ball game. We switched tickets. Got that section up here down on the field level so everybody could enjoy the game, you know. It's amazing. Yeah, we've been to those. But you ask my boys. You can ask my boys. Where'd y'all go most of the time? Where'd your daddy take you? He'd take you all them concerts? Yes, sir, he did. Where'd y'all go? We went to see the Kingsmen, the cathedrals, the hoppers, gospel music. Y'all didn't go to them rock? No, we didn't go to no rock bands. Y'all didn't go see? No, we didn't go see. Y'all didn't go? No. Stay with me now. Godly. What's your mama going to be known by? What's your daddy going to be known by? Worldly entertainment. Daniel here, he purposed in his heart. He would think differently. He thought differently. His thought patterns were not Worldly, it was godly. Why? Because he knew God. He's walking with God. He wasn't in all the worldly amusement. He wasn't keeping up with what's happening on whatever. Here's the second thing I'm done. Do you think like the world? Do you live like the world? Do you act like the world? Here's the second thing. Daniel's consistent life. And Daniel purposed in his heart. Verse number 8, that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat or with the wine that he should drink. So he, he purposed in his heart. Now God had brought Daniel into favor. You notice that? It's amazing. Into favor, the Bible says, into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. It's an interesting verse in the book of Proverbs. Let, let me give it to you. I didn't put it in PowerPoint, but let me give it to you. Proverbs 16 and verse number 7 says this. When a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies, even his enemies, even his enemies, he maketh even his enemies. God maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Isn't that amazing? When his ways please the Lord. Hmm. When you're resolved. When you're resolved to give your heart and life and go live for God, let me tell you what's going to happen. The devil's going to make sure you put to the test. Yeah. Won't be long. You'll get an opportunity to 
Prove it. Prove it. Prove to me you're going to live for God. Are you really going to live for God? Or are you going to cave? Are you going to really live for, put God first? So they test him. They put, him, put his testimony on the test. Uh, Melzar, Melzar arrives, and verse number 10 says, The prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who hath appointed you meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are your sort? Then shall ye make me in danger, my head to the king. And he says to him, then said Daniel to Melzar, who is the prince of the eunuchs, hath said over Daniel, Hanani, Mishael, and Azar. Azariah. And you remember back in verse number seven, these Babylonians changed their names. Th these men had godly names. They'd been assigned names from their birth to glorify God. Daniel, uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were given godly names when they were born. Daniel, of course, means God is my judge. And they changed it to Belshazzar. Bel meaning, of course, a Babylon chief de deity. And, of course, Shazar meant something, someone to protect you or whatever. And, of course, Hananiah is God is gracious. And they changed his name, of course, to Shadrach. means uh, illumined by the sun god. They give him a name to reflect Babylon, to reflect the world in which he lives. Mishael it means who is like God? Who is like, there's no comparison to our gods, what his name literally means. He changed it to Mishael. Meshach, excuse me, Meshach. Mishael was who is like God. Meshach is who is like Venus. Yeah, give you an earthly name, sensual love name. And then Azariah, which means the Lord is my helper, had changed his name to Abednego, Abednego, which means literally Nego, I am a worshiper of knowledge. Hmm. They wanted to change all their names. But Daniel just ignored all that. You notice it? How he does that? The Bible calls reference back to it in verse number 11 and gives them back their proper name. They don't call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Like we do. We know them by those names. Isn't it amazing? We memorize those names. We don't memorize their proper godly names. And yet he states and he requests what? He requests uh, conviction. Verse number 12, he says, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let us give pulse to eat and water to drink. He said, let us live by our conviction. Will you let us live by our convictions? Verse 13. And let our countenance be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children to eat of the portion of the king's meat that thou seest. Deal with thy servants. So he considered to them, he, he consented to them in the matter and proved them ten days. He requests of the chief of the eunuchs, and the chief of the eunuchs granted his request. He consented to them. Now, what made this chief of the eunuchs consent to their request? Can I tell you what it was? It was his consistent life before them. He didn't buck up. He did, it was his life of living before them. You and I have to live a life before people in such a matter that they respect us and we respect them. He's in charge. This prince of the eunuchs is in charge. He's in control. Why in the world would he grant him this request, Daniel's example of courage and faith overcome Melzar's fears. He's fearing, man, I don't want my head on the chopping block before the king. If, if you mess this thing up, I'm going to be in trouble. And Daniel assured him, hey, man, I assure you, we, we, we're going to be all right. If you just give us a chance, give us a chance. Let us live out our convictions. We know the true and living God. And he goes by that in verse number 11 by his true and living God's names that he give them. He said, we're living according to what God has already showed us. We know the God who reveals secrets. Can I say it that way? That's not right there in that verse. But what he's saying is we still believe God. We're still trusting God. Hey, can I tell you, when it gets rough in these days and you and I live and we're called upon to do all kinds of things that are against us, if we'll stand true and say, hey, we still believe God. We're still going to have to trust God. Will you give me a chance? 
I've been doing a good job, but I, I still going to have to trust God. I, I can't give in to that. I'm going to still trust and believe God. Now look at God, Daniel's confidence in the last part of this chapter, and I'm done. The Bible says, verse number 12, look back at it. He said, prove thy servants. I beseech thee ten days. He said, just put it, put it to the test. Put God to the test. Now look down at verse number 15. And at the end of the ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they drank and gave them pulse. He gave them what they asked for. And for these four children, God gave them, watch this, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now look at verse number 18. At the end of the days... That the king had said he should bring them in, and the prince and the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was not was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them. He found them, watch this, ten times better than all the magicians, astrologers that were in all his realm. God proved true to them. And God will prove true to you and I if we'll trust him and stand in these days. We're seeing an onslaught, of course, in this age, in this day, in this month in which you and I are living. And of course, uh, we're living uh, and learning to live lean in a land of plenty. So we learn to live by God's law. That is what he wants us to do. And live and trust in him. Obedience to God. It'll make life sweet. It really will. And the result, of course, of this test of faith and obedience, obeying God and trusting him, we'll find, of course, what? Health, understanding, and learning God's secrets of trusting him, obeying him. Daniel and his friends were found healthier than all the others. And even the unbelievers saw the difference. And they'll see a difference in your life and my life as we walk by faith. And we trust God. Oh, I'm telling you, those who live close to God learn what? His secrets. They learn how to walk with him and trust him and obey him. And it can bring a world to Jesus as we obey him, trust him, learn more about him. Daniel was given an understanding. As you read more and more in this book, you'll find out God used Daniel mightily in a pagan world. To show himself mighty to a lost and dying world. And God can use you. And God can use me. And God can use you. And God can use you. And God can use you. To show a world his might and his strength. And his truth of judgment to come. If we allow him to. And we'll walk close to him. And what? We'll understand that his way is the best way. And we'll sell out what? Sell out to purpose in our heart. To live for him. And not give in to the world. Do you know him as personal savior? Have you trusted him? Do you really believe his way is the best way? I'm going to pray. And then we're going to come with an invitation to uh, verse. God speaking to your heart today. Will you come to him? Will you trust him? Maybe you had not been living like you ought to for him. Maybe you won't come back to him. Trust him. Draw close to him once again. I'm glad he can give you that clean heart. I'm glad he can purge you and make you whiter than snow. I'm glad he is a trustworthy God. Will you come to him today? Whatever you need may be, will you come to him today? Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your truth. I want to thank you, Lord, that you are real. And uh, the promises of your word are ever trustworthy. Lord, I'm glad you will help us in this day and age in which we're living. Lord, you'll prove yourself worthy if we'll just trust you, sell out to you, and live for you. We don't have to be like the world. We can make a difference in the world around us. Help us, Lord. Help us to respond now to what you've spoken to our hearts about. Make a difference in the world around us. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. We're standing, we're singing, God speaking to your heart. Will you come today? Come on, come on. <laughs>